Welcome back. Hello. <laughs> I just. Thank you. It is, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say it is a genuine pleasure to have you all here. Um, you know, some of you were following our stuff over the lockdown and our YouTube um, streams, and I genuinely wasn't sure how many people were going to come tonight. Um, I was sort of setting up the lecture theatre and coming out of my office and imagine, uh, imagining talking to like 10 people here because no one knows we exist anymore. Um, so yeah, it's genuinely lovely to have you. So thank you for everyone that has returned. Uh, thank you to everyone that it's your first time here. We do these every Wednesday all the way through the winter. Uh, rain or shine, rain tonight, so no observing, unfortunately. Um, so the way it works is if it's a nice and clear evening, we have a talk and then we go and we do some stargazing with our telescopes. Uh, tonight is not clear and so we're going to have a talk and then we give you tea and biscuits as a sort of consolation prize. And then we have a second talk uh, by the CAA, the Cambridge Amateur uh, Astronomy Association. Um, for the second half, actually, some people have expressed some interest in seeing the antique telescopes. Um, so maybe if you've got some young people with you, um, let me know. So at the end of Tea and Biscuits, at the start of the second talk, um, if you've got young people and you'd rather have a look around the telescopes, just wait around outside and we'll have a look. There's a sort of a limit of about 30 or 40 people, um, but uh, yeah, just we'll, we'll talk outside and we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I think that's all the housekeeping. I think the only thing, only thing remains is to introduce our headline speaker, uh, Dr. Orr Grau, who is from the University of Portsmouth, uh, and he's going to tell us all about supernovae, the superheroes of the universe. Uh, so Orr, over to you. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'll second what Matt said. It's so good to see people again. <laughs> uh, I haven't done this in way too long. So today I'm going to tell you about supernovae. And as the title implies, I think that supernovae, the explosions of stars, are the superheroes of the universe. And today we'll talk about a few things. We'll discuss the physics of these events, what exactly are they, um, what they leave behind, how they affect the galaxy, as well as our very own existence, and maybe someday non-existence. And then we'll wrap up with what exactly you can do to study supernovae yourselves. And by the way, I'm, I'm not kidding, this is a superhero from the DC universe who is called Supernova. I'm, I'm sorry to say he's rather boring, <laughs> and I hope I won't be sued by DC for saying this, um, but I am happy to say that the science is much more interesting. So before we get to Supernovae, I think it's important that we understand what Novi are because supernovae aren't just supernovae. Um, I'm skipping a lot of history here, but today basically we, we know that novae are the thermonuclear explosions on the surfaces of white dwarfs. A white dwarf is a type of dead star. It's made up of carbon and oxygen, and it doesn't do anything aside from just cooling for all time. Except, unless you place it in a binary system with another star. And if the white dwarf and the other star are close enough together, then the white dwarf can start st to steal gas from its companion star. That gas will be composed mainly of hydrogen because most of the stuff in the universe is hydrogen. And it will start to accumulate on the surface of the white dwarf. Now, white dwarfs are incredibly hot. The, the surface temperature is millions of degrees. That's hot enough to ignite the hydrogen and get it to start fusing into helium. If that fusion process happens too quickly, if a white dwarf is greedy and tries to steal 
too much gas from its companion star too fast, then what will happen is exactly what happens if you try to eat too much too fast. There'll be a thermonuclear runaway explosion on the surface of the star or in your gut, and that will lead to a huge explosion that will cause, uh, that will create a flare that's tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands as bright as our sun, and will last for a few weeks to a few months before it fades away. What's important here is that these explosions don't destroy the white dwarf. They do destroy whatever hydrogen had been accumulated on the surface, but the core itself, that carbon-oxygen core, that remains intact. And the white dwarf can then do what all of us do, which is once again start feeding off its companion until you get another eruption and another eruption and so on. Supernovae, on the other hand, are the explosions of dying stars. Okay, whereas a nova left the star intact, super, supernovae destroy the star completely. Okay, supernova equals death. Supernovae are also much, much brighter. They're billions of times as bright as our own sun, and they remain bright for years. Supernovae, some supernovae are so bright that we can see them halfway across the universe. The one up here, which I discovered in 2008, exploded some 9 to 10 billion years ago. To put that in context, the solar system, including the Earth, has only been around for 4.5 billion years. So light from that exploded star started traveling towards us before there was anything here at all. Okay, so in order to talk about exactly how stars die, we need to understand what stars are. In the most basic of terms, a star is a big ball of very, very hot gas. This is this ball is made up of hydrogen, mostly, some helium, and trace amounts of heavier elements. But that's not, eh, doesn't do much. Because this thing is made up of gas, it's made up of matter, it feels gravity. Gravity operates between every particle of gas on every other particle of gas in this ball. And that gravity constantly tries to collapse the star in on itself. This is how stars are born. Okay? They're born from huge clouds of gas that hang around in space and slowly, over millions of years, condense due to gravity. As they condense, they become dense. They become denser. And the temperature inside keeps going up and up until inside the core the temperature is high enough to ignite hydrogen and get it to fuse into helium. When you do that, two things happen. One, as part of the fusion process, you get light and that light makes its way out of the star and the star shines. And the other is that you get an outwards facing pressure that balances out gravity and stops the star from further collapsing in on itself. Okay, that's why our sun is still there. Okay, in stars that are more than eight times as massive as our sun, the following will happen. Eventually, the hydrogen in the core will run out. Without fuel, fusion will stop. Once fusion stops, that outwards facing source of pressure disappears and gravity wins. And the star will once again start to collapse. But as it collapses, 
temperature will start going up again. And it will reach a point where it's high enough for helium to start to fuse into carbon and oxygen. And once again, the star will stabilize. At this point, the core will be somewhat smaller and the outer layers of the, stars, of the star will puff out a bit and we'll get a red giant. Now we have a stable red giant, everything's fine, everyone's happy, except that eventually the helium will run out as well. And then, again, you'll have a contraction, temperature will go up, oxygen will start fusing into silicon, contraction will stop. And so you'll go through these stages of fusion and contraction, fusion, contraction, fusion, contraction, until finally the core is made up completely of iron. When you get to that point, fusion will stop and, and will never start again. That's because up until now, each of these fusion processes produced energy. We got energy in the form of light and in the form of neutrinos. Tiny, tiny subatomic particles streaming their way through the way through the star and through everything. Right now, there are millions of neutrinos streaming through you. Um, they don't do anything to you, don't worry. Uh, but iron, in order to fuse iron into heavier elements, you need to inject energy. In essence, you need to hook the star up to an external battery. Can't do that, and so fusion stops. And when that happens, gravity wins, and the star once again collapses. Now, we're going to separate two, um, two things happening at once. We're going to talk about what happens in the core, and then a few slides down, we'll talk about what happens to the rest of the star. Let's talk about the core. No, no support, gravity's pulling everything in, the core collapses. As it collapses, the density gets to such a point where the protons and electrons in the nuclei of the iron atoms fuse to create neutrons. And so the core, which used to be this big ball of iron, turns into a big ball of neutrons. This is going to become a neutron star. So, so on the left, your left, we have an example of a neutron star. That's the uh, very bright white point in the center. Neutron stars are small. They're about the, they're about the size of New York City, but they're very massive. They, the, they have a mass that's a few times um, that of our sun, which means they're very, very dense. Okay, now, you, you must have all seen videos of this where you have an ice skater spinning, right? And they have their arms outstretched and at some point they fold their arms in and they spin a lot faster. Same thing happens with stars. All stars spin, our, star, our sun spins on its axis. But now you go from something that used to be as big as, as a star to a neutron star that's only as big as New York City. And so that thing is going to spin a lot faster than the star did. If it had a strong magnetic field, then you're going to have an object, a magnetized object spinning very, very fast. That thing is going to launch these jets you see here of charged particles, protons and electrons. And if that jet is aimed directly at our telescopes, then we'll get a lighthouse effect where we see the Newton star and then it spins away. We see the jet, it spins away, we see the jet and so on. And these things spin very, very fast, periods of seconds down to milliseconds. You can also get these larger clouds of spinning uh, charged particles around the Newton star here. Now these are actual images taken in x-rays. Just take a few images at a time and you get this very nice movie. 
So that's your Newton star. When it spins that fast, it's called a pulsar. If, however, the star is too massive, and by too massive I mean more massive than around 25 times the mass of our sun, then the Newton star won't be able to stabilize. And it'll just continue to collapse until it becomes a black hole. And that's how you get most of the black holes in the universe. You, many of you may have heard of the supermassive black holes that live in the centers of galaxies. Those beasts are millions to billions of times as massive as our sun. But most of the black holes in the universe are only a few times more massive than our sun. A few tens to a hundred or so times as massive. So that's the core. While all this is happening in the core, the rest of the star is also feeling the effects of gravity. The rest of the star is also collapsing in. And, that, and it's going to collapse on to the Newton star. But as the Newton star stabilizes, it bounces back. And if these are the outer layers, that Newton star is bouncing into them. And that's, that's going to, sh to send a shock wave ripping through all that infalling gas. And when you get a shock wave ripping through something, that's going to accelerate that gas outwards. And all of, the, all of that gas that used to be the star is now blown out into space at speeds uh, of tens of thousands of kilometers per second, which is a few percent the speed of light. So when a star explodes, right, it doesn't vaporize like you see in movies. Okay? It's not that what used to be the star disappears. It's that the gas that used to be the star is now freely um, expanding into space at a huge velocity. And, it's, and it runs into all the gas that's, that you have between stars. Okay? Because space is not empty. Space is full of gas, mostly hydrogen. It's, that, it's just that the density of that gas is incredibly low, much, much lower than the best vacuum you get here on Earth. But when you, but when you think on cosmological scales, it's still enough that when, the, when what used to be the star runs into it, once again you get a shock. That shock you can see here as these blue tendrils on the outside. Everything you see inside, that's what used to be the star, which has now been lit up by this shock. And it's, uh, and it's emitting, in this image, you see it emitting x-rays. But we also see it emitting in the radio, in optical, and other wavelengths. If you get a few stars exploding in the same place and roughly at the same time, then the, the supernova ejecta, right, the, all, all this gas running out into space, they will coalesce and you'll get one big shock wave running out into the gas between the stars. And that a combined shock wave is strong enough to excavate bubbles in the gas between stars. Our sun is currently traveling through one such bubble, which we call the local bubble, which we think was, um, was the result of about 15 supernovae that went off 14 million years ago. You can see here a few of these bubbles carved out in, I think this is, I think in red we have hydrogen gas. The other thing that happens, and you could see some of that here, the colors, the colors you see here indicate certain elements. 
That's because the other thing that happens when you get a shock wave running through gas is that from the gas's perspective, you just hooked it up to an external battery. You just injected energy into all of that gas. And so its temperature shoots up very quickly and you get explosive nucleosynthesis, which is a really cool way of saying you get a lot of elements formed very fast. And this is how we get past iron and we form many of the heavy elements in the universe. So in, in here, all these different colors show you um, X-rays emitted by certain elements, right? Silicon in red, sulfur in yellow, calcium in green, and iron in purple. <clears throat> in this periodic table, all the elements that are shaded in either green or blue are created in a supernovae. The other thing that's important to understand here is, is that we're not just creating elements, we're also spreading them out into space. Once you do that, they mix into all that hydrogen lying out there, and eventually they get recycled into new stars and planets and carbon-based life forms that need the oxygen to breathe and the calcium for their bones and the iron for their blood and so on. So it's no exaggeration to say that without supernovae, we could not exist. On the other hand, as you asked me before, supernovae can also exterminate life. For a few years now, um, astronomers have been finding signatures of a radioactive isotope of iron called iron-60 in Earth's oceans and on the surface of the moon. You, we see this in rocks brought back by the Apollo missions. Iron-60 has a half-life of a few million years. That means that all the Iron-60 that was on Earth when it was formed four and a half billion years ago is long gone. Any Iron-60 we see today had to come from somewhere else. It can come, and it can only come from supernovae blowing stars apart and creating this isotope. So, from the, um, from the deposits we find, we can say that this Iron-60 had to have rained down on the solar system between two and three million years ago. Now, coincidentally or not, 2.6 million years ago, there was a large extinction event of marine life. About a third of all marine species went extinct, including this uh, giant marine sloth. So it's tempting to say, okay, 2.6 million years ago, the sun moved through an area where around 10 um, supernovae went off and they did something. Perhaps um, UV light from those supernovae destroyed the ozone in the atmosphere and killed off all those animals. Maybe. Um, Everything I say right now, this is not definite yet. This is still, people are still thinking about this. Um, what we can say though, is that eventually, as the sun travels around the center of the galaxy, we will encounter some supernova that's close, that happens close enough to Earth that, yeah, it will wipe out, it could wipe out everything here. We don't think this will happen for a good few million years. There are no nearby stars old enough that we expect them to go supernova in you know, the next decade or so and be near enough to actually do something to us. Someone asked me about Betelgeuse before the talk started. Betelgeuse is, we think, should explode and very soon, any time now but it's too far away to have any real effect. It'll be a really cool explosion in the night sky. I, I, I really hope it happens in my lifetime, um, but it's not gonna do anything to us. So we've, talked, we've mentioned the sun a lot, 
uh, I want to put your minds at ease, our sun is not going to blow up as a supernova. It is going to die, like everything, but not like that. Our sun is currently in what we call the main sequence stage. It's fusing hydrogen into helium, it's stable, everything's good. In about four and a half billion years, it will run out of hydrogen, and now, as you all know, it will become a red giant that fuses helium into carbon and oxygen. A few million years afterwards, um, it, uh, it will run out of helium, and then it will just leave behind a white dwarf. Our sun lives alone. The, we don't have a companion star, and so there's nothing to cause the white dwarf to blow up. The outer layers of the red giant star will slowly push off into space, not explosively, just nice and slow, and they'll be lit up by the light from the white dwarf and we'll get a really nice planetary nebula. But otherwise the sun, the white dwarf sun, will just sit there and cool down. Of course, we won't be here anymore. Um, as a, uh, the red giant sun will envelope uh, Mercury and Venus, maybe Earth as well. Even if it doesn't swallow Earth, uh, as it becomes brighter and brighter, things here will become hotter and hotter, and basically life will just cook away. So we won't be here to see the red giant, uh, the red giant phase or the white wall phase. Hopefully we'll be here, you know, beyond the next century or two. Right? Any young people here? It's up to you guys. Um, but after that, the sun will be fine. So, how do you blow up a white dwarf? This is what I work on. This is what my colleague um, Casey here in the audience also works on. Let's go back to that nova. Okay? If you put the white dwarf in a binary system, then things can happen to it. We get a nova if the white dwarf is too greedy. But if it's not, then it can slowly accumulate that hydrogen on its surface and go in mass, okay, without anything bad happening to it. But as you go in mass, the temperature in the core rises as well. And eventually you get to a point where the carbon can ignite. And then you get a th carbon thermonuclear explosion that completely <laughs> destroys the white dwarf. That's one idea. Another idea is that you have two white dwarfs. As the white dwarfs orbit each other, they lose energy to gravitational waves. And slowly, they grow closer and closer until finally they merge. And now you have, again, a more massive white dwarf. More massive equals hotter equals fun explosion. So, which of these actually happens in nature? Maybe one of them, maybe both of them. Maybe there's another explanation. We don't know yet. We've been working on this for a while. It's what pays, pays me to be an astronomer. Um, one of the things I do is use the Hubble Space Telescope to look, to observe these types of supernovae uh, years after their explosion. And those observations give us the way the light from the supernova fades away years after the explosion gives us clues as to the state of the white dwarf just before it exploded and what exactly was happening to it before. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to you. We, we live in a, a very special time for science. Um, you, you might have heard how universities are, are supposed to be these ivory towers where we lock ourselves in, eat four meals a day, and don't let the public know anything about what we do. In reality, those of us on the inside are constantly trying to tear down the walls. And today there are many ways that you can get involved. So you can become citizen scientists, 
You can join actual experiments on Zooniverse, not just in astronomy, but in anything you want, biology, social sciences, history, lots of really cool things on there. If you don't want to do the work yourself, you can let your computer work for you. Uh, there are lots of experiments on Boink that would love to use your computer. If any of you ever had the SETI screensaver on your desktops, that ran on Boink before it was called that. Or if you have your own telescopes, uh, you can join the growing ranks of amateur astronomers who scan nearby bright galaxies and find nearby bright supernovae. And there are a few amateur astronomers who are so good at this that they publish papers with us and the only difference between them and us, right, the only thing that makes them amateurs and us professionals is that we get paid for this and, and they do not. <laughs> Um, that's kind of the difference between, that's the same difference between Sherlock Holmes and Scotland Yard. <laughs> so I hope I've gotten you excited about supernovae. If you want to learn more about these, um, these really cool events, I have a book out. <laughs> um, it's out in stores right now. It's small, so it's cheap. Um, and that's it. I'll, I'll be happy to take your questions. Wonderful, thank you. Absolutely fantastic talk. I'm really fascinated.